live. Oh, wow. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to Hyundai Hangouts. Uh, today is the 24th of June. It's episode 293, which comes to be 69 episodes after episode 224. What do you say, right? 69 <laughs> episodes. What's going on, everybody? <laughs> Welcome. Hernan here. And we're just going to do the, the proverbial uh, roundabout because uh, Mr. Adam is not here. I don't know where he is at, but hey, Bradley, how are you doing, man? I'm good. Happy to be here. It's hot as hell there now, right now, though. It's like middle of summer and it's nasty, but uh, but yeah, things are good besides that. Awesome. Chris, how about you, man? Yeah, things are pretty, pretty good here. Weather is nice. No rain. Um, it's not as hot as with Bradley. Like evenings and stuff are still chilly and cold, but like things are pretty lovely. Awesome. And you, Marco? Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. <laughs> you see it? <laughs> I've been telling, I, I know, I've, I've been joking for years about the weather in Costa Rica. Never really showed it because I don't like to have a camera on my computer. I said, this is where I do all my work. This, this is my, my workstation and I want to, and I like to stay focused. But now I'm doing more video and more stuff. So I decided that for a year, for a year straight, I am going to show my camera every Wednesday on Hump Day Hangout so you guys can see for yourselves. This is it. This is it. Somebody asked me, I mean, don't I get sick? Of this weather, I'm like, fuck no! Don't you guys get get tired of of, the, of that heat, that oppressive, humid, and, and just nasty heat, Hernan? Like, like 110 sometimes around where he lives, and the cold, minus 10. Don't you guys see? Don't you guys get sick of that snow up up to your ears? I got this. I got this up to my ears. <laughs> there you go, Pofu. So um. Okay, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Hyundai Hangout. If you're here for the first time, welcome. This is the Semantic Mastery Crew. We try to help you as much as possible with anything and everything that has to do with digital marketing, answering your questions, SEO, growing your digital agency, whatever it is. And this is free. It's being free. You will keep on being free. So drop your questions here, um, and uh, and we will try to help you out as much as possible. Now, before we jump into the questions, a couple of things. The first one is that 4th of July sale for both yep. Semantic Mastery and MGYB is coming. And it's usually, I would say, our second largest sale of the year, followed only, you know, the first place might be Black Friday, Cyber Monday. The second largest sale of the year is uh, uh, 4th of July. So if you're into saving money and if you're into getting results for your clients, Stay tuned, make sure that you're open next week emails because it's going to be pretty awesome. We're going to be giving you guys some really cool discounts and stuff. It's going to be pretty, pretty cool. Anything that you guys want to add to that? Yeah, we actually polled people, right? And we asked them what they wanted from us, what they needed from us. And so our sale is going to be according to what people said they would want from us. So we do listen to you guys. We do try to give you as much as we can. That's why we've been live uh, free hour for what? Going on six years now? Yeah. It's almost going to be it. six years. Think about it. And we're here live every Wednesday answering your questions. Just because, right? We want to give back to the community. That was the original idea behind Hump Day Hangouts, and it stays the idea behind Hump Day Hangouts. We're giving back to the community that gives us so much, that allows me to learn so much and allows me to uh, tinker with Google as much as I do. So this is a thank you from us to you yes sir all right so that's basically it if you guys want to learn how to take your agency to the new, to the next level go to 2x your agency.com that is the number two letter x your agency.com if you have a couple clients you want to take it to 10 clients 15 clients 20 clients however many and then guess what once you have that amount of clients you don't need to worry about fulfillment because we do it for you and mgyb.co so if you go to mgyb.co you go there you get all of your fulfillment needs ready to go so all you need to focus on is to build your team and grow your business so i think that's it we should jump into questions, right? No, no, I, 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 before, before we go to the questions, guys, go to our go to the uh, YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button, right? Help us out. We like helping you, but help us grow by going and subscribing, getting those notifications so that you can stay abreast of what's going on with Semantic Mastery, Heavy Hitter Club, MGYB, and everything else around Semantic Mastery. So there you go. 
Sweet. Oh. And subscribe so you don't miss the 4th of July sale. There you go. All right. Well, we got a lot of questions already, so I yeah. think we should jump right into it. Let's, Let's go. go. Let me grab the screen. Zoom will cooperate. Okay. You guys are seeing my screen, correct? Yes. All right. Yep. Uh, I think I'm okay. Yeah. All right. I'm just making sure I didn't have any sensitive tabs open with client <laughs> stuff that I need to worry about. It looks fairly decent. All right. <laughs> We're going to start right off with this question from five days ago. He says, I have subscribed to Access Wire for doing press release distribution for a client. Question one, does press release distribution correlate with rankings in any way? Um, and then question two is if yes, are there any best practices you tested? Yes, and yes, it does. Because here's the thing, and, and you know, we've got a uh, relationship with Jeremy, one of the co-owners of Press Advantage, um, which by the way, in, in, very soon in the next couple of weeks, two or three weeks, something like that, we're gonna be doing another webinar with him and opening it up a special again for people that want to have their own subscription accounts to Press Advantage, which is the same distribution service that we have available in MGYB. For anybody that's doing a lot of volume, I always suggest having your own Press Advantage subscription. There are other providers out there, Access Wire being one of them. There's there's many of them now, actually. Uh, and there is a big difference between the distribution networks. Like there are there are certain common there are certainly common distribution sites that get used by almost all distribution services or by you know a, a, a fair a, a vast majority of them but there are also depending on the relationships that are forged between the distribution company and the distribution partners or outlets right where they depending so that's usually something that it's a relationship that has to be uh built and that's why you know you have you have it really does make a difference to have a good um distribution service one that has you know selects good sites with good traffic, good metrics, that kind of stuff. Nothing real spammy. Here's the problem. I don't know necessarily about access wire. Uh, I, I have tested them in the past, but it's been at least two years and I've only done like a couple of one-off press releases with them because I, you know, and I was always testing against press advantage. There are some really good ones out there. Press advantage being one of them. Another one is um, quantum newswire, which is a, a, one of our mastermind members actually developed that. It's a really good service as well. Um, but what you have to be careful about, and, and again, I'm not speaking directly about access wire because I don't know, haven't tracked it in a, in a few years, uh, a couple of years at least, is that some distribution services will pad their numbers or inflate their numbers with like WordPress sites and such that they, they call distribution sites, but really they're just republishing the press releases. What press releases are too, but part of the benefit of press releases is that they get published on high trafficked uh, sites that are like media sites, right? News sites. So just creating a WordPress site to republish press releases to isn't necessarily a good thing. In fact, it could even be toxic if those sites are really spammed sites. A lot of the media distribution sites that are distributed to that are part of an actual, you know, media network, they are typically high traffic, high authority sites. So they typically um, don't, you know, not considered as spammy or toxic. Whereas a lot of the networks or distribution um, networks that we, you know, I've tested a lot of them, guys, and I've a lot. The reason why I've stuck with Press Advantage is because they've had uh, a really good selection of sites. Is my point, and they're that's growing. Like Jeremy's been working on developing relationships with. So Press Advantage has been dealing with developing relationships for years now with companies. In fact. Um, well, I don't know what I can reveal here, but some new ones are coming. And that's part of the reason why, and, or, or are already available. But anyways, that's part of the reason why we're, we're going to have another webinar with him in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but that said, yes, it does. There is a, a correlation with rankings because again, if you're, if you're not careful and you, get, you distribute press releases to spammy sites, they can actually end up being toxic. So that's, there's a couple of things that you can do if that's the case use the press releases to link back to your tier one entity assets as opposed to your money site directly. There's, I saw there was another question um, from one of our members, uh, Nathan Smith, I believe further down about using press releases to, to the link directly to your money site. I do because of press advantage being a good distribution service. But again, if you're, if you're not sure or you haven't tested and you don't know what the distribution looks like yet, then I would recommend linking back to tier one entity assets instead of directly to your money site. 
So what are those, right? GMB uh, map, GMB website. If you're using, uh, if it's for local, uh, you could link to the SEO Shield properties, which is what we recommend. So Google Drive, Google Site, Google Drive stack, uh, you know, the files and or folders, an ID page. Um, you could link to your major social media, your syndication network properties. There's a number of things that you, any tier one entity asset really. And so that's what I would recommend just on, to be on the careful side. If you've got a subscription to access wire, publish a couple of press releases, linking back to tier one entity assets first, then look at the distribution reports and go through it with a fine tooth comb and see if there's anything in there that's, you know, particularly spammy. If so, then I would recommend, you know, looking for another service or just using it the way that I just mentioned. Okay. Anybody want to comment on that? No, I mean, the answer to the question is yes, they, they, they are correlational. We do find that, that do, uh, doing regular press releases helps with rankings. Now, whether it's because of the links, because of, his, uh, because of the distribution, just whatever it is. Now, I will say that whenever I run a press release, it, it does get hit with link building. I don't just do a, a press release and then nothing behind it. So whether it's the link building to the press release or the press release itself, uh, like we, we don't know unless you run a, like a separate test, just press releases. I know you've done that and press releases and, and link build. That's not something that I'm going to get into in here for free. At any rate, when you do them correctly, when you stack them, like, like it's taught in uh, PR, oh, what is it? A PR pro press release. Local PR pro. Local, sorry, local PR pro. It's fantastic. It's fantastic for pushing uh, the map into the three pack, pushing those posts, boosting the posts. And then pushing from the post over to the website through the uh, now I'm, I'm giving way to it, through the do follow link that you can get doing it all that way, but you're still pushing relevance and power over to the website, but you're putting a buffer in between a buffer that will help your map rank anyway. And then when you stack those and you build links to those as you're stacking them, right around the third, fourth, or fifth press release in the stack, you see things just just kind of just take off. I, but it, 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 if you do just one, <clears throat> it may or may not help, depending on the competition in that niche. But when you, when you stack them and you do the link building, you run those embed gigs and link building, it works really, really well. It's probably a combination, right? Because uh, we do talk to Jeremy on a regular basis. We ask for <laughs> a lot of stuff that he does for us, right? Like the, the, the media page has developed over time because he, he's, he actually asks us what we would like and we tell him and he does whatever he can within reason, right? We, we, can't, we can't get everything that we want. I'd love to, but we, we can't. So, and then the other part, I forgot what, what the second part of that question was. Um, uh, he so yeah. said, if yes, are there any best practices you tested? Local PR Pro. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, um, as a kind of an add on to local PR pro, which we made it public. So it's available. And that's why I was pulling up on YouTube. It's available publicly on our channel. Uh, if you just go search for YouTube press release SEO or press release silo stacking or whatever, you'll see it comes up or you can go directly to our channel. So YouTube, youtube.com slash semantic mastery and use the channel search feature and just type in press release SEO. And you'll see, this is the video uh, we did about 11 months ago. Um, it's an hour long, it's a webinar, an update webinar that we had did for our Marco and I did for MGYB, but again, it's just it's publicly available it's where we talked specifically about how the press release stacking kind of changed slightly. It evolved, right? Which is now we, we silo press releases the same way that we would silo, um, blog posts or GMB posts or all of the above, right? So go check that out. It's an hour long, but it, it tells very specifically the strategy on how to silo press releases and then just to stack them. And that's where the magic happens. That's what Marco was just talking about. You get four or five press releases into it and you'll start to see significant movement. And we've proven that over and over and over again. So that's what I recommend. And I'll talk a little bit more about that strategy when I get to the question uh, that I saw Nathan post earlier. Um, we'll, we'll get to that here in a few minutes, okay? It was a good question though. All right. So the next question is from Benjamin, or I'm sorry, Benjam. <laughs> he says, I followed your recommendation and purchased Jeffrey Smith's SEO bootcamp. Okay. Yeah. I remember this. Remember you from last week. He says, I no longer have any questions about how to silo a website. That's right. Cause he's, he is the man when it comes to that stuff. He says his process for writing posts is more involved compared to curated posts, though, in order to create top, uh, though, in order to create topical depth. 
I was about to start with creating curated posts for content kingpin, but now I'm wondering the best way to proceed. The SEO bootcamp process uncovers the topical keywords for each silo and the questions associated with them to use in writing seven to 900 word posts. Hiring a writer to write researched and well-written articles sounds expensive. And yes, it, it, it very much is. When you hired a subject matter expert to write posts, um, it, it's, it's, it can be very expensive. Or even just a good writer might not even be a subject matter expert. They might go research to be able to write good posts, but that's expensive too. That's why I use curated posts. Is, there something, is this something that can still be put in the hands of a writer in the Philippines for $10 a post or is it going to cost more? Okay. So my answer to that is, you know, Jeffrey has his method. Um, I follow his on-page methods for siloing and things like that. Uh, to not not 100, I don't follow all of his methods because it, it's a lot of work. Um, and we've been able to, uh, you know, some of the methods that I use, I'm able to still achieve results. So it really depends on what you want to do. I don't typically go for those longer posts. What, what, I, uh, what I do is uh, curated posts. My bloggers handle all of that. That's because... I've got a couple of really good bloggers that I've trained over the years that um, do curate content curating that are really, really, really good at it. And I've taught them some SEO tactics as well so that they understand how to interlink properly, which tags to use depending on the type of silo structure we're using, all that kind of stuff. So I like to use curated posts because it's efficient. It's less expensive. It's easier for people that, you know, they don't have to research for every blog post. So it's a lot more, a uh, lot, lot less expensive. Um, so can you still use curated posts for topical depth? Yes. However, keep this in mind, you know, you can kind of make a hybrid out of the two, which is kind of what we do. Uh, you know, occasionally, not all the times, but occasionally we'll go, I'll tell my blogger to go scrape all the questions, you know, the, the, the FAQs for a particular topic, right? For, for the uh, project that we're working on. So where do you get those questions? Well, there's keyword or excuse me, question scrapers out there that uh, you can use. I know there's also, you can just go to answerthepublic.com and you can type in some keywords and it'll come back and show you commonly asked questions. You can go to Google and ask questions as if you were somebody looking for the product or service that you're blogging about, right? And ask questions as if you were inquiring about that product or service and then see what the accordion boxes are in Google search results with questions. People also ask, right? And each time you click one of the drop downs to reveal the, it'll show the question, but you to reveal the answer, which is just curated snippets of Q and A's from other websites. That's all that accordion box is. You can use those questions in your own content and a curator can still use those questions. And in fact, think about this. The questions plus the answers are right there in the accordion, uh, you know, the accordion box in, in the Google search results. And like I said, each time you click the drop down menu or the drop down arrow, it actually shows, reveals more questions and answers. And so you can scrape those and they actually give you the link to a snippet and then a link over to where that question is answered on, you know, on that particular site that there's, that they're citing, right. Uh, that they're attributing it to. So you can actually use that in your curated content guys. Think about that. So it's, it's again, it's a very easy way to start adding FAQs or questions and answers to blog posts um, that your, your, you know, your VA is publishing or whatever. And the curated content can be right there unless it's a direct competitor, which I don't ever recommend linking to a direct competitor, but a lot of the times they're not direct competitors. And so you can actually take the cop, the question and answer right from the Google search results and paste that into a, a, a blog post, make sure you cite the source of the answer. And just like you would any other type of curated content. And there you go. So again, you can go about it both ways. Um, Jeffrey Smith has his own specific method and he's very, very good at being able to rank like crazy for some really difficult terms with little to no backlinks um, because of the way that he structures and does long depth content, you know, long, well-researched, long form content for blog posts because of the volume that we do uh, that my, you know, my agency does and my bloggers do, I prefer the curated content and it reads well, it looks good and everything else. So again, it's, it's up to you how you want to do it. My method is to use silo structure with the linking the, the way that I've been taught from Jeffrey Smith and from Marco, <laughs> my partner. Um, but, you know, again, I like because of the volume that we do, I just it's not really it would be too cumbersome for us to do the long form content all the time for posts and not to mention expensive as well. So it's really a preference. You can get away with doing it um, either way or create kind of a hybrid of the two. 
Any comments on so, that? Yeah, our, our keyword research gig in mgyb.co uh, is based on, on the, the training that we're talking about, where we go into all of the different tools that are available and we pick up as many keywords re that are relevant in the niche as possible. We get as many as possible. We go into all of these tools, we go into SEMrush. You don't need uh, uh, a subscription to SEMrush or SEMrush. You don't need it for Uber Suggest. You don't need it for Answer the Public. You don't need any of these because we give it to you. These questions will also pop up in Answer the Public. We give you that. And, all, and also the questions that are, that are brought up when, when we do the SEMrush uh, research and every other research. So you get all that and you get it. it, 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 it like it's all categorized for you. We, we take care of all that so that you don't have to. So that it, it, when you get that back, you can hand that over to your writer and then your writer is responsible for finding the content. Now, what Bradley said makes perfect sense because you take that keyword research and you can still build the topical relevance by inserting the, the, the proper keywords in, in the way that Jeffrey teaches it and interlink in that manner. Nothing stops a good writer from curating and adding the topical keywords, the relevant keywords and interlinking right. those. I mean, what's to stop you? I don't understand why curation has to be so difficult. It's the simplest thing in the world. You go and you find, here, here's your list of topical keywords that you have to add to this uh, long form, 700 to 900 words. You're going to work those in and then you're going to interlink to other pages or to another page, however it is that you choose to do it, the tags also, but that's the curator, the curator can do all that. You don't have to have, and, and I'm doing air quotes, original content. It's original because it's curated. That's and right. listen, proper attribution simply means that you're giving credit to the original source. Nothing says that you have to link to the original source of the content. Remember when, when, when you were doing proper citation and proper attribution, when you were writing a paper in college, those of us who, who went before the, the internet, right? You used to cite the source in your paper, right? And, and you do annotations you, 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 and you would cite it that way. That, that's proper and that's fine. Look at the way that Wikipedia does it. Now they do know follow it, but sometimes it's, it's not necessary. They just cite the source and you don't even have to hyperlink it. It doesn't have to be a hyperlink to be proper attribution because you're giving credit and you're not using the entire article, you're using a part of the article, maybe a paragraph, which is, which in, in most cases is proper use of that paragraph because you are citing the source and giving proper attribution without having to, to add even a, a no follow link. So it depends on how you approach this. I would totally approach it and I do. From that standpoint, when I have the keywords in, in, in that niche and you'll find this, at, uh, I know you, a lot of you guys are new in, at this. When you start getting heavy into entities and you start using the, the Google's natural language processor and you start using some of the online tools like TextRazor to refine your content so that you get the, 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 the most relevant content on that page, well, you'll get a, a, a list of words that, that, that you can use and your writer has to be able to go in there and use those words in that content so that you're also working with the natural language processor and what Googlebot is looking for as far as entities on that page. So everything has to be related. Everything has to be relevant, not just content for the sake of content and for the sake of keyword. It has to all make sense at both the unstructured data level, which is content, right? Writ written content and the structured data level, which, which is the, the schema. Google wants LD plus JSON. So when all that matches, when all that matches, and then you hit that with the power that's available through our SEO power shield, the, the thing that happened, well, you saw that guy in, in, in the Facebook, in the free Facebook group, I think, where he got his drive side back and he couldn't believe the result. I can't believe you guys control uh, SERPs this way. It's not that, 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 that we control SERPs, it's that we know what the bot is looking for and we feed the bot constantly. That's it. And it doesn't have to be complicated like it's being made here. They're not mutually exclusive. Let me finish with that. 
So I just wanted to demonstrate what I was talking about. So I, I just went to Google one for, you know, for tree service stuff, which I do most, most, a lot of it's like, I just typed in a question, how much does tree removal cost? Right. And so here you go. Here's questions right here. People also ask. And if I click on any one of these, you'll see that it also, it, it starts to reveal additional questions for each time I click, it adds three, two or three more. Right. And so you can go right through here. Now, if we scroll down to the bottom of the page, it's seeing my, my IP. It knows that I'm in Culpeper, Virginia. So some of these may very well be, most of these are likely not going to be competitors, but they possibly could be. But if you see right up the top here, it gives you some additional menus or, or items there. So I just clicked and add, you know, to add California. And just because again, you know, it, it doesn't matter where, where you're really located. If you're, if you're just using it for topical relevancy, then I, I could click through here and start copying some of these questions and answers, the ones that are relevant and pasting them into curated posts. Does that make sense? And cite the source. So again, it's just, it's just like you could copy this right here, just like you see it here and then paste that into a blog post and there you go. And then just make sure you're citing the original source. So again, that's a way you can start working those questions and answers into to posts that, that are curated because that's a lot more and it's very efficient. It's really up to you how you want to structure uh, your content production. I prefer the curated method just because that's what my team has been doing since really since 2000. And I don't know, I, I used to actually write the posts or curate posts myself until I realized how time consuming that was going to be. And then I basically created Content Kingpin and started training virtual assistants, which it wasn't Content Kingpin at the time. It was training for virtual assistants, but then we turned it into a product because uh, it worked so well. So anyways, it was a great question though. Thanks. So the next one is from DCS. He always says, hey guys, no questions from me this week. I just want to issue an apology to MGYB for publicly questioning the keywords submitted for my shield. Okay, I remember this from a week or two ago. Um, anyways, he said, it was totally my fault. I let my son watch what I was doing and how I work. And because he saw that I was using a couple of keyword tools, one of which happened to be keyword shitter, <laughs> which I am... Uh, which almost never you normally use, he wanted to actually join in. Naturally, as an 11-year-old, he took great interest in the name, <laughs> played, around, <laughs> played around with search terms I was using, and I ended up uploading the wrong file. Oh, wow. So please accept my apolog uh, apologies. One brain fart from me, and everyone ended up with a headache. <laughs> well, no problem, DCSEO, and it's, uh, that's, that's big of you to come say that um, on Hump Day Hangout, so thank you. We appreciate that. Mark, yeah. do you want to comment on that? No, no. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I mean, I, it, it, it's really good that someone first called us out publicly and I did, I really didn't know what he was talking about. It really surprised me that we would do something like this. And, and, and I did say that we'd take care of it, but when we went to look, this is what we ran up against. And thank you, uh, DC, for coming back in here and, and straightening things out and letting everyone know that it wasn't our mistake. Now we do own up to our mistakes, by the way. It's not as if we don't make mistakes. When we do, I just want everyone to know that, that we make it right one way or the other. Okay, so the next one says, hey guys, according to Google's documentation, same as schema support has been dropped around two years ago. Do you think they lied and for what purpose? Yeah, Google lies all the time. Like there are pathological liars. Uh, Google also said that guest post links don't work. Google also said that, uh, you know, um, building backlinks won't work. Google also said, I mean, we could go down a long laundry list of things that Google, usually when Google tells you something doesn't work, means do more of it. <laughs> yes, Google lies to you all the time. Google lies to you. Uh, so yeah, the, the, I mean, that we, we could really move on to the next question. Mark, do you want to comment on that? Or yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would just like to, to ask, like, like, how did they reference that same as schema support has been dropped? Because we saw, we see, and I see this all the time in the natural language processor, Google's own schema tool, right? That analyzes entities on, on, on written content that it references same as schema. And so how, how can support be dropped for same as schema if NLP is using same as schema? Makes absolute no sense. It just shows you. I mean, I, I'd love the link to that. If you have it, just drop it in here or, or drop me a note in the free Facebook group and I'll go take a look because I know and I can show that Google is using same as schema. Yeah. I've shown it, by the way, in heavy hitter club webinars, we've gone into the natural language processor and we've shown how, how Google references entities through same as. 
Yeah. And so I'm just going to finish reading the question. Uh, yes, I, I still include same as, and same as isn't just for local business schema. It's for organization or corporation schema. It, so I use it all the time and uh, I absolutely use it. And I, you know, I always just talk about the ones that use my main tier one entity assets, main social profiles. And then for local businesses, I always go look at whatever uh, citations also or profiles or whatever show up for a, a, a business name search in Google plus phone number. So I do whatever the business name is and then also add the phone number in the same search query and hit, you know, search. And then I extract or, or pull all the URLs off the top two pages that show up in Google that are relevant to that business, which they should be when you do that type of a search. And I add those to same as as well. And, um, and, and it works, it works really well. So anyways, he says, I personally think they use reciprocal links for verification and possible uh, ML as many social profile profile icons show up in the knowledge graph and search without any usage of same as schema. Since Yoast and other SEO plugins removed same as for that reason, do you think it is worth it to add that schema to the money site manually or to throw some plugin made from a Google's not a Google's non-believer same as meta keywords? Yeah, again, I add schema. I'm, I'm even starting to use more of structured data for, uh, you know, even like marking up blog posts and such. Um, because remember, structured data, guys, is code. It's, it's specifically talking to the bot. So there's no reason not to use it, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I still use the, my, my favorite tool for generating schema is this one. And I've, I've showed this many times before, but you can just go to technicalseo.com. And there's tools uh, and they've got, you know, schema generator over on the left-hand sidebar. And this is what I use mainly. I even use Jeffrey Smith's SEO ultimate plugin or ultimate pro plugin on uh, all the sites that I manage now, but I still use this tool right here to generate most of the structured data that we add to pages and posts and things like that, because this is just what my team's been trained on. And there's really no reason not to use it. So, but there, I mean, anything that you can mark up with structured data, you can. So when it comes to same as, if you can squeeze it in to organization or corporation or local business schema, why not? You know, it's not going to hurt. So, uh, and, and as Marco said, it, yes, they still use it. Okay. Muhammad's up. He says, Hey guys, there's this car dealer asking me for SEO services in a city where I always work with a dealer. How should I handle this? I don't know if trying to rank two businesses in the same niche in the same city as possible, both practically and morally. How would I rank both? Uh, am I wrong? Do I turn him away? How would you respond to the cl inquiring client in this case? That's a good question. Um, you know, I've had that issue only occur a couple of times. Typically I won't because it does create kind of a conflict even for me. Um, so typically I won't do it unless I am transparent about that, if that makes sense. Um, and say, well, listen, you know, I've already got a client in this city. So yes, I can do SEO for you. I can't guarantee you that I'm going to, you know, that, you know, I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to push you above them. Um, I will do equally as good for both of you. That's the only way I could see addressing it. I've turned work away though, because of that being an issue for me. So that's just, you know, my opinion. I know others probably have other opinions as well, but the only way that I would, would do it is if that was disclosed and they were made aware of it. Um, and, and if they were, if agreed to it, it, it to, can, to, to proceed moving forward with you, then so be it. It's out in the open. There's nothing to hide and there's no moral or ethical, um, you know, problem there, if that makes sense. But any opinions from you guys? How do you guys handle that stuff? Yeah, I, I don't, I only take one client per niche per city. Like I can't, because there's only one number one. And my focus is entirely on making that one client number one. I cannot make two people number one. Someone is going to end up number two and not happy. Even when, even when they, when they knew ahead of time that you already had a client, they will be unhappy. I would say find someone who's really good, Muhammad. Recommend that person and, and get a finder's fee. That's how I handle. It. I, I, I just hand. Sometimes I just hand them off to our mastermind members. I say, hey, here, go close this guy. He's hot. But I, I, I can't, I can't take the lead. I, I can't. Eth to me, that this is a matter of ethics. First of all, right? If you don't tell the guy then you can only make one person number one. Even when you do, someone's going to be un unhappy. Muhammad. So avoid that headache. And here's the funny thing. Uh, one of my, I still have one of them as a client, but one of my first uh, really good clients was a roofer. 
and he was an identical he had an identical twin brother who also owned a roofing contracting company uh so there were two roofing contractors identical twins they lived in you know neighboring or adjacent counties but they had the same service area and it was funny as hell because i met the i met the one guy and signed him on as a client and within i don't know two or three months he you know, was bragging about me to his brother and his brother hired me. His bro- and, but it was funny because when his brother contacted me, you know, he said, yeah, my twin brother told me to contact you because you can, you know, you're good at SEO and blah, blah, blah. And it was funny as hell because they were, you know, it was, it was hundred percent transparent. They both knew that they were using me uh, for, you know, for SEO, they hired me for SEO, but it was, it was, it was a, it was a fun relationship with them because every time one of them would move above the other one, I'd get a call from the one that got knocked down. He'd be like, why do you like him better than me? You know? <laughs> and it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, one of the brothers ended up running into some financial issues at some point and he uh, canceled services with me about a year ago, really. Um, and I still, I still do some things for him, but it's, he's not a, on a monthly retainer like the other client is, but it was, it was just, it was a really fun um, kind of relationship between dynamic between the, the uh, me and those two identical twin brothers but that's unique in that they were identical twin brothers and they weren't really, comp- I mean, they were competing, but it was in a friendly way versus like two, you know, businesses that don't know each other. So that's why I said the only way that I could see doing it would be if it was trans, if you were transparent up front and just said that you're going to work on both of them equally. Um, and, but like Marco said, somebody's always going to resent uh, where they are. Whoever's not on top is going to always have um, resentment. So I agree. I, I would just turn it away. Next question is from Eric. He says, hello, I'm interested in purchasing your syndication networks for my YouTube channel. I've watched the course SEO syndication network from Bradley Benner, and I just wasn't sure what would be more beneficial for a YouTube channel, the single tier or the multi-tier? Okay, that's a good question. Also, can you give me an idea on what results I could possibly have for my YouTube channel using your syndication network? I know it will help for my search results on Google, but will it help with my actual YouTube rankings? And yes. Okay, so the first part of that question is what will work better for the YouTube channel, a single tier or a multi-tier network. I always preferred using multi-tier networks for YouTube channels, uh, YouTube video for YouTube SEO, basically. Um, Here's the thing though, guys, like just having one multi-tiered network is not going to, I mean, it it could, I don't know what niche you're in or what keywords, the difficulty level of the, you know, what what type of competition you're facing or anything else. Um, What, what really works well is to, create the multi-tier or build, you know, or purchase the multi-tier network and then power it up. Right. And by the way, with YouTube guys, you can keep adding networks, right? You can keep adding tier one networks, multi-tiered networks. You can use the same channel to continue triggering. We never recommend that for blogs, for blog syndication, but for YouTube syndication, honest to God, you could, you could put, you know, 15 multi-tiered or two tiered syndication networks to one channel. Uh, you could go way beyond that. It's, 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 it's unlimited and you will get better results the more you have. However, it's not just the syndication network that provides the results, it's also powering it up. So that's link building. You can do embed, uh, embed gigs as well to the syndication network properties or link building to the syndication network properties. That way you can power them up so that each time you upload a video and it syndicates out across the network, that they're, um, you know, being syndicated to profiles that have been built up with a lot of inbound links, if that makes sense. So it really depends on what your uh, budget is and how aggressive you want to be. But, you know, start, in my opinion, or my recommendation would be to start with one syndication, one multi-tiered syndication network, start seeding that network with content from your YouTube channel. So in other words, start syndicating content from your YouTube channel. Also look into YouTube SEO, uh, sorry, uh, YouTube Silo Academy. Um, I think we still sell that. <laughs> I, I, I think we, we don't know what we sell. We suck at marketing. Yeah, I, I don't know if we, I don't know <laughs> if that, uh, if that product's still up or not, but it should be. And if not, it's in one of our bonus sites um, for sure. It's like a $7 product, or at least it was, but YouTube.silo.academy. It's like I said, it teaches you how to silo YouTube channels with playlists. So that's very important too. So what I'm getting at is start seeding that first network with content. Then you can start building links to that network, which is what I would recommend and see what type of results you're getting. If you need more, then you can either continue to power up the existing network because it now is seasoned. It's a little bit more aged. You started to build authority to it through link building and you can always add on additional networks as needed. So you can add an, on another sing, um, 
single tier or multi-tier network and then keep adding up and then subsequently start powering those up as well. So uh, again, I always preferred for YouTube, like, you know, when I was doing a shit ton of YouTube SEO, which I don't so much anymore because I, I do a lot of YouTube ads. So Google ads for YouTube. Um, but when I was doing a lot of YouTube SEO that I, I would usually start off with three or four multi-tiered networks for any new YouTube channel project that I was working on. Cause I just liked having that massive amount of power right off the bat. Okay. Uh, can you give me an idea on what results I could possibly have for my YouTube channel using syndication networks? Well, again, it's, it's an SEO tactic more than anything, but engagement is super important for ranking YouTube videos more so in YouTube than in Google, but also in Google as well. Uh, YouTube's algorithm is more about the engagement than it is SEO signals. Um, Google is still very much, you know, it's still heavily weighted towards SEO signals. So it depends on where you're really trying to rank. If whatever your videos are, if the type of content is more suited for YouTube rankings, then I would recommend that you um, buy engagement signals, which means traffic from Google. Again, using YouTube ads. We have a training course on how to do that specifically too, because that's going to help you to rank in YouTube way better. So it depends on which, where you're trying to rank. Is it Google or is it YouTube or is it both? If it's both, then syndication networks, backlinks, embeds, that's what's going to work for uh, the SEO side of things, right? So ranking in Google. If you want to rank in YouTube, SEO signals have play a part. There's no question, but also engagement signals is weighted heavily in YouTube and you can, you can buy engagement signals from Google. Don't buy fake views from other, you know, from YouTube view providers. Don't do that. Don't buy fake comments and fake likes and all that shit. Uh, Google's algorithm or YouTube's algorithm has gotten really good at figuring that stuff out. Just go buy traffic from a relevant audience source inside of Google ads. It's very, very inexpensive. And those engagement signals will help it to rank in YouTube. Okay. Uh, could it help my videos to go viral with YouTube? Thank you for your help. Well, no, I mean, it could. If, remember, if you, if you rank at the top of search results, um, going viral typically isn't from a search result though, right? Going no. viral is from people sharing it. So if you've got good video content that that's what's going to make it go viral. Um, you know, typically, I mean, again, I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's that typically content goes viral because people see it and they, they start sharing it. And they, one person shares it to one person that shares it to three people. Those three people share it to three people and th there, there it goes. Right. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, again, I would, I would recommend buying engagement signals if that's the case, which when I say that, I mean, using YouTube ads to buy traffic. Okay. All right. He says, uh, DC SEO says, I lied about not having a question. I'm assuming the RYS expansion is the extension needed to target other key search terms and it's added to my SEO shield. Yes, you got it. Also, what's the best way to approach an e-com site with no physical address with regards to the shield? That's a question for you, Marco. You don't need a physical address unless this is a local project. And if it's e-com, it shouldn't be hyper-local. You're looking for something that's national or global. I've always said the approach is if you're local, it's, lo it, it, it's uh, brand plus keyword plus location or brand plus location plus keyword, however you want to do that. That's how you brand. You relate everything to your brand and to the location where your brand is. If it's not, then it's brand plus keyword association. That's the only difference. And so how you approach that is you build out your, your, your brand. That's your entity. So let's put it this way. A physical address is part of a local entity, but is not necessarily a part of a global entity unless you want to set the corporate headquarters somewhere to give it just a little bit more validity, right? Amazon has corporate headquarters, so does Apple, so does it, you know, Google, whatever. And you know exactly where those are. So if you want to kind of fake it till you make it, you would do something like that. You can set a, a post office box with a street address as your corporate address. Nothing stops you from doing that. Nothing stops you from faking the address, although eventually you'll have to clean that up and imagine having to, to go back and, and having to clean up that, that fake address. That's a mess in and of itself. But just for this purpose, you can go and get an SEO shield and an expansion stack without a physical address. There you go. All right, Olaf Sub says, is there any automated way to get the links of a newly syndicated post to send them in for link building? Or do I have to get them manually from each platform? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. You know, yes, you can set up like a Zapier or a 
you know, if you go set up a zap in Zapier, for example, where you submit the RSS feeds of the blog properties in your syndication networks, that will feed the new post URL into a Google Sheet, right? Think about that. So now you've got one Google Sheet. In fact, you can even set different tabs, right? So on the sheet, right? So you can, so the, the Google G Sheet, you can set different sheets or tabs, whatever you want to call them on that sheet and use that same sheet for, you know, Blogger, Tumblr, WordPress. And I'm just using those three because those are the three main blogs that we use within the uh, syndication networks. So my point is you can take the Blogger RSS URL, create a Zap and Zapier, where that's the trigger, any new post, right? Any new feed item, uh, then push that new feed URL or excuse me, that post URL into a Google sheet. And the first tab in the sheet being blogger, the second one being Tumblr, the third one being WordPress. If you needed to separate them for whatever reason, you could do it that way. And now you've got your um, you know, spreadsheet, excuse me, with the links. You can even have the post titles uh, pushed through. You, know, you can chip, pick and choose which data you wanna push from the RSS feed into the sheet. But now you've got a Google sheet that you can use to very quickly extract the URLs that, to paste in for link building purposes. Um, you could even make that, you know, uh, you could even link build to the Google sheet for that matter. So there's a ton of things that you can do with that with Zapier. So yes, you can absolutely automate that. Okay, that's a great question, by the way. BB's up. What's up, BB? He says, hey guys, uh, what do you, why do you want for the RSS of the other authority channels to be changed frequently when submitting the super feed? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, I really don't understand that question. If you can clarify that, I'll come back. Uh, I'll try to answer the second part unless it's dependent on the first. He says, number two, because there is minimum of text length of 300 words in each page post submitted, I wonder if words inside a block quote tag, which is basically words from other site will be considered or counted in articles text length, yes. If it's it's text on the page, it's it's counted as uh you know, it's still counted as text. It doesn't matter whether it's in a block quote or not. It's still counted. It's still adding relevancy to the page via text. <laughs> so yeah, if you were taking a like a screenshot of text and inserting the screenshot, then maybe no. But Google can even read images now, from from what I understand. So so it might even count towards that. Uh, maybe not text length, but the relevancy anyway. So my point is, yeah, if you're adding text in block quotes, it's not going to make any difference. It's still adding to the article's text length. This is what Content Kingpin relies on to simplify the question. Let's say an article has 250 words, and if adding a quote with 50 words, will it count for 300 words in the article? Yes. Yes, it will. And don't get caught up in article length. I mean, you'd, I wouldn't suggest anything less than 300, but again, with curated posts, guys, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have a problem being able to create, you know, five, six, five to 600 words, a thousand word posts, because it's, you know, you can curate several pieces of content into one article, right? One curated post. And then all that you have to do or your blogger curator, right? Which is what I call blogger now. Uh, all they have to do is, you know, an opening paragraph, which could be a sentence or two, really just, you know, explaining what the idea of the post is going to be. Then curated content to support the idea of the post with just a little snippet of, of um, commentary, right? So the author of the post, the publisher of the post, creating a little bit of, adding a little bit of content in between the curated pieces within the content and in a conclusion, which could just be a sentence, which is typically a call to action, right? And that's your opportunity to link to an internal page on the site, if that makes sense. So again, you can, you can, you can make longer form content, which I recommend using curated content where you really only have to write, you know, a couple or, or your blogger only has to really write a couple of hundred words and you end up with a long form, long form post if that makes sense. So it's about adding relevancy using other people's content. That's the point. That's the whole point of curated content guys. All right. Fitz is up. Good day, gents. Thanks for this forum to get real world answers that work. You're welcome. Fitz as always. He says, I have a client that wants to know what to do with his side business website. The market has atrophied because of COVID, but he expects the market to come back. How can he mothball his site to weather these times, but not lose rankings and have to work twice as hard when things bounce back? How would he sell the leads to, how would he sell the leads to some online platforms that would benefit from customers like his, but they are in different market. I'm not sure about the second part of that question. Uh, as far as how to mothball his site, I like that term. Um, you know, an SEO shield, one of the best things in the world you can do because typically once something ranks and, uh, you know, using those, that method, it sticks for years and years and years. Um, 
we're running out of time, but I, I, you know, I could show the Virginia SEO agency, uh, G site that, that keyword still ranking. Some of the other keywords dropped a couple spots and took five years for them to move at all <laughs> down at all. Uh, but I, I specifically targeted Virginia SEO agency with, um, that particular keyword in one press release blast a few weeks ago, when I noticed that the, uh, G site for, you know, for, for, for those, those different terms, that I usually use as an example started to slip a little bit after five years of not budging. So I targeted Virginia SEO agency with an anchor text uh, link for that keyword, Virginia SEO agency with press releases and it brought that keyword back to number one. So that's what I'm saying is if you use the SEO shield, you've powered up that site, it's ranking well, the entity is strong. I'm sure Marco will comment on this. Then it, it takes a lot to move it guys. So that's what I would do. I can't really answer the second part of your question because I'm not sure what you mean. Um, but Mark, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I don't understand that second part either. How could he sell the leads to online platforms that would benefit from customers like his, but in, in a different market? I mean, you, you can sell it in online platforms that, that handle different leads from different niches, right? There are those. Uh, Ring Partner being one of them, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're not going to get paid much, but but at least someone will, will be handling the, those leads and potentially make money. Now, leaving something in in mo uh, mothballs and, and untouched. If everyone else, so this is what, uh, all things being equal, if everyone else is leaving theirs mothballed and untouched, then there's no reason for his website rankings to move. But if there's someone actively engaging the niche then it's likely that, that, that you will drop. I mean, it took five years for Virginia SEO agency to drop, but that was getting other signals. That was getting people to come in. So it, this, is, this was ranking, it was ranking number one. It was getting people to come in and contact Bradley. They, they'd actually fill out the contact form. That's a very important signal. And it would get these on, on, a, steady, on a steady basis. Now, what people have done is like the people like Clutch SEO and a few others, they've also, been at this and they've been at this really hard and they've been coming at this keyword for years <laughs> for years trying to take bradley down. now bradley hasn't been doing any work to it nope it's just been sitting there none and these guys are just forcing it so it just goes to show that if you mothball it eventually activity relevance trust and authority is going to come in and take over and the activity part of it is, is going to take you down because there is none with your project that's the only thing i would warn against but definitely do everything else that's available to you and, and stick it. Stick it there as hard as possible. It gets mothballed, fine. Uh, the, the, the people are still coming in and, and you're selling the leads. I mean, that, that, that's all that you can do, right? I don't see anything else that I can recommend regarding this. Yeah, I was just looking to see if that, I did one press release, I don't know, three weeks ago now, maybe a month ago now, specifically yeah, to push that. And I used Virginia SEO agency as keyword anchor. I wouldn't recommend doing that to a money site, guys, but this was to a G site. Uh, so all the press releases got published had Virginia SEO anchor text link pointing back to the G site and that pushed it boom right back up to number one. Uh, and that, that press release isn't even showing in um, the news, you know, Google news anymore. So that's, that's interesting, but it still pushed that keyword back to number one with one press release. So, yeah, but, and, and again, as Marco said, I hadn't touched that in five years, I hadn't done a damn thing to it. And that's the honest to God's truth. And then it started to slip a few weeks ago, finally, after five years, and, uh, and I pushed that one keyword back up with one press release, believe it or not. And again, that's a Google site. I wouldn't recommend doing that to your money site. Which but it work. ain't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> when, when, when Bradley and I talked about this, I told him, do a, do a PR stack and, and, and go after the terms, like Virginia SEO, SEO Virginia, and push it all back up. Don't just do one. Yeah. Right, we have, we have well. an account for that. Let's, let's get uh, press advantage to, to push it up. Or get daddy to build some work. links to it. Yeah. yeah Why well, do it? It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Why would you do that? All right. So I got a couple more questions I'd like to get through uh, these next three really quick because, uh, and we've only got a few minutes left, but two of them are really related to press release stuff that we've been talking about a lot today for some reason. And so whatever you do, is, sorry? And whatever you do, don't click on that bottom link. Okay. Yeah. You're going to see my fat face. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's two Bradleys ago. Yeah, that was a long time ago, man. <laughs> that was a lot bigger then. Anyways, go that you guys can have a good laugh from that. Anyways, uh, Nathan says, do you link to money site page posts that you're trying to rank on every press release you do? 
Do you ever link to the same money site page post you're trying to rank more than once? Yeah, but typically, again, if you go back to what I was talking about earlier um, and go watch this webinar that we did, it's on our YouTube channel, guys. It's free. Go watch it. Press release SEO and PR stacking. Just go search for it. You'll find it. Watch that, okay? Because that is the method that I use, which will um, say is a perfect segue into the question down here by Tushar, who says, Bradley, you may have answered this post, but just make sure it's okay to point multiple press releases at your blog on the money site. For example, if I write four blog posts every month, can I do a press release for each blog post that is also linking to that blog post? I'm worried at what point does it become spammy? That is exactly what I'm talking about, okay? So remember guys, with the syndication networks, the strategy that we talk about is content marketing from your blog, right? That so you you publish content that's route in within you know place it within silos. So you publish posts within silos, and in your internal linking within every single post supporting article that you're going to publish within a silo, you're going to be linking back up to your top of uh, silo, right? Your silo landing page, or daisy chaining to the next the previous post in your in the silo, whatever. However, you're internally linking within your silo. The point is. So you're publishing, publishing a press release with an internal link to what you're trying to rank on your site, right? So it's an, inter, it's an internal page or post on your site that you're trying to rank. So each post that you publish is going to contain a, a link to that. Then that's going to syndicate out across your syndication network, okay? Um, then I publish, again, my bloggers, not like some of my clients get, you know, three posts per week, but they're only paying for one press release per week. So one of those blog posts per week will get a public a press release that is essentially promoting or highlighting, showcasing the blog one of the blog posts. Does that make sense? And the the press release links to the blog post, so the blog post URL. Does that make sense? So my point is, you're pushing power from the press releases to the blog post. The blog post contains the link back up to the page that I'm trying to rank. So you're pushing juice in from the press releases to a a, a blog post which is one press release that's published for one blog post. So the next time you publish a blog post, it's a different URL. It's a different deep link on your site that, that you're linking to from the press release. Do I sometimes link to the same page perhaps with, pre with more than one press release? Yeah, but not often because I like the deep linking strategy that I just described. And again, it's, you can see exactly what I'm talking about in that webinar there. And that just tends to work really well. Again, because guys, think about this. If you're siloing blog posts together, you can also publish a GMB post if it's for a local project that is linking to the blog post, right? And just grab a snippet of content from your blog post and use that as the text for your GMB post. Use the same featured image, right? So you're mirroring your blog post silo structure in your GMB posts. Then you do the same thing with press releases. Publish a press release for every blog post or for as many as you can afford, if that makes sense. Well, however aggressive you want to be, and uh, the press release writers are going to write about the blog post. They're going to link to the blog post if that's the target URL you provide. I also like to usually provide another tier one entity asset URL. Uh, but you can also remember you can you can tier that. My my point is, guys, think about this: if you're stacking your doing uh, a silo linking and stacking your content in your silos on your blog, you can mirror that in your GMB posts. You can also mirror that in press releases, right? So if you're linking from the press release to the blog post that the press release is highlighting, you can also link back to the previous press release in that same silo. Again, that's a press release silo. So you're mirroring the same sort of structure in your blog, GMB. By the way, you don't have to have a GMB. I'm just saying if you're doing local, you can also do it there. You should also do it there. And also in your press releases. So that way you're not hammering the same URL over and over and over again. You're hammering the same URL over and over and over again from your blog with an internal link which I, I would recommend varying the types of links within your blog posts, right? Different keywords, naked URLs, all that kind of stuff. But you're pushing links in to different parts of your site through the press releases and or the GMB posts. And then you're siloing those press releases as well. Does that make sense? Hopefully you guys get that. Again, just go watch this webinar and it will make perfect sense to you. And it's super, super powerful guys. And that's a free webinar, okay? And if everything is linked correctly and the way that it's supposed to, juice is going to flow anyway. I mean, that, right. that's the one thing that you really, and I know Nathan is in our mastermind, so he knows exactly what I'm talking about. If everything is interlinked the way that it's supposed to, to a crew page rank, to a crew ranking score, then you don't need to insert uh, 
press releases or any other type of link building into the same page time after time after right. time. You can build it in other places and everything from that link building will benefit. I mean, everything in that stream will benefit from it if you've done it the way that you're taught. Now, if you go and do it your way, that's up to you. But we teach you the right way. All right, so the last one, it's five o'clock, so I got to wrap it up, guys. But I want to answer Jonathan's because I kind of skipped over it. Jonathan says, image SEO question. I have search query. I have search query that is a first and last name with the only SERP feature being image carousel. Um, how would you go about getting the images you want to show on the carousel? Thank you. Okay, well, I've, done, I've been able to accomplish, first of all, optimize the images. So alt text, uh, meta, metadata and stuff that you can optimize the images that you want. Um, also make sure that uh, you can build links to images, guys. Think about that. You, there's, there's a number of ways that you can do that. Um, so you can build links directly to your images. Now I wouldn't buy spam links to like the image URL hosted on your money site, but if you can publish that same image in one of your entity assets and then hammer that you know, image file URL on that in one of your entity assets with backlinks, that'll help it to rank as well. And I'm sure Marco's got a few tri tricks to help you with that too. No, no, it's, it, it's not trick tricks. We just see it from, from the SEO shield because we're yes. mirroring everything. We're including the, the, the same images. When that gets uh, links into it, it powers everything up. Land Solutions Network has a bunch of its own images in the image carousel when you look at the, at the brand when you do a brand search for Land Solutions Network, it has a, the image carousel. It has the video carousel. Doing it in, if, if there's a G, GMB, adding images in, in the GMB will benefit, right? From the link building, everything you, else that you do to the GMB. If you're stacking your post the way that you're supposed to, if you're li interlinking the, the post the way that, that, it's, that it's taught in, in local GMB Pro, then all, all of that is going to benefit from everything that you do. The whole point is that you do it correctly from the start so that so you're not cutting off the link juice at any point in the process. And here's one trick, and then we're going to wrap it up, guys. We're going to close it down. But uh, if you're using press releases, we've talked a lot about press releases today, so I feel like it's only fitting that I, I bring this up. Again, through MGYB, it's going to be distributed through Press Advantage. You're going to be, it's going to be first published on the Press Advantage domain through the organization page that we'll set up for you if you don't already have it. If you have your own subscription, then you'll know what I'm talking about. You get an organization page, you publish a press release, include an image in the press release because that's super powerful in itself. Press release images often will rank in those image carousels, okay? Because they're republished on so many media sites. Make sure that the file name is optimized when you upload it to Press Advantage or give it, submit it to us. Um, then if you have your own Press Advantage subscription, you can add your own alt, alt image, uh, uh, you know, alt tags to it, uh, which again, you can squeeze keywords like the name in this case, the first and last name that kind of stuff. Then once it's been published, if you look at the HTML code of the press release that's been published on the press advantage domain, you get the, the image file URL. Now you can take that and you can hammer that with backlinks and that'll help that to rank in the carousel. I know because I've done it. So anyways, uh, you can also, by the way, if it's, if it was for a local project, you can do something similar with images that are hosted on Yelp, for example, you can hammer and also Google, Google maps. If you upload images to a Google maps profile, GMB profile, when you go to view that in maps, you can extract the uh, URL of that image from the address bar of your browser and you can hammer that with links and that will help that to rank as well. So I think I gave away a lot there. All right. Yep. Thanks everybody for being here. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks Marco for sticking around. Bye everyone.